Today, we're given access to a very rare and closed community. The first ever established religious kibbutz in Israel. It was a very simple childhood. There was no wealth. We all wore the same basic blue kind of clothes. Our tour guide, Danny Herman, aka Danny the Digger, a famous Israeli archaeologist and a private tour guide who calls this kibbutz his hometown. I, as a child, Sergio, I had to come here every morning for morning prayer and before going to Shabbat. Wow. Then you stand here in the front and you are leading the prayers. Danny's taken us around the kibbutz to show us the peculiar lifestyle as he grew up here. We'll go into the communal lunchroom, we'll take a sneak peek at a fascinating synagogue, and as a bonus, we're going to see some of the most fascinating archaeological discoveries in this area. Discoveries so big that some of them were taken into the Museum of Israel, while others, the originals, are still hanging on the walls right here for all to see. They had no idea that in 1956, on a hill just facing the kibbutz, they will find an ancient building with a menorah in the mosaic floor. So join us on this adventure as we explore Israel's first religious kibbutz, Tirat Tzvi. Oh, there he is. Uh, I see him. I'll park right here. Hey, Danny. <laughs> Good to see you. Hi, Rod. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Good to this see you. This is really exciting. Okay, this is the kibbutz where I grew up. I've known these fields for years. That's awesome. We're going to look at all of this now from an archaeological perspective. So let's do it. So Danny invited us to the kibbutz that he grew up in. This is kibbutz called Tirat Tzvi, and they're famous for making meat and all kinds of products. And he's taking us for a lunch in kibbutz. I've never had lunch in kibbutz before. This is exciting. All right, so how was it like growing up in the kibbutz? For me, it was a beautiful childhood. Look at all the green grass yeah. and no cars. I mean, there were barely any cars in general, but you didn't have any cars driving inside the kibbutz. So you could go wherever you want. We used to play soccer a lot. We had a swimming pool and there's no admission fee or anything. You know, you go to the pool as much as you want. Wow. I'm, I'm surprised I don't have skin cancer because we, we <laughs> used to spend so many hours in the swimming pool. So what is a kibbutz and how is it different from a regular village or town in Israel? A kibbutz is a collective community. It was started by the Jewish immigrants in the early 20th century who bought lands from the local dwellers and founded the kibbutzim. Originally, the main concept of the kibbutz life was socialism, Zionism and agriculture. The founders believed that there should be no employers nor employee at all, and that there must be a better way to live, a way in which personal wealth does not exist. Okay, I have a question for you, Danny. Let's say somebody wants to join a kibbutz who has a possession, assets, maybe his wife has like a lot of gold jewelry or I don't know what. Do they have to give their assets to the kibbutz or can they keep them? In my time, you hand it over to the kibbutz. Okay. But people who went to the kibbutz in the first place usually didn't have much to offer anyway. Okay. That's why they came to the kibbutz. All right, makes sense. But in theory, if you join the kibbutz, first of all, you don't automatically ex are accepted. Mm. You go for a period of trial, are you socially fit for us and so on. And if you do, then everything that you own is now kibbutz property. Mm -hmm. In the early kibbutzim, life was communal and cooperative. There was no personal wealth, everything was shared and everything belonged to everyone. So those who wanted to become kibbutz members had to give up their property and possessions. But in reality, people, especially Americans, would come with their stereo, they would keep it. Mm -hmm. I don't know about jewelry, and, but, but I do remember that some small possessions that Americans especially that joined the kibbutz, that they could keep it, but in their home. You would not have okay. a car, you would not have a motorcycle. Okay. Everything on the outside will be equal. Okay. The kibbutz life of today is much different. 
over the time, the structure had changed, allowing a much greater independence for the members of the kibbutz while keeping the cultural integrity of the community. Okay, one difference from my time, now you need to pay for your lunch. Oh. Even as a kibbutz member, but on the other hand, anyone is invited to, have, to come for a meal. Oh, that's good. Danny is inviting us for a lunch at the communal dining room, a place where food once used to be free. But after allowing the kibbutz members accommodate personal wealth, they started charging its members the cost of food. Still a relatively low price to pay for a delicious meal. This is not a complete kibbutz if you don't have a soda machine. You had a soda machine in the kibbutz? Yes, that was <laughs> two benefits in the kibbutz. I told you there wasn't much wealth, but two benefits. The swimming pool, go as much as you want, and a soda machine. The best part about this ordeal is that outsiders like us are now allowed to dine here, and for a marginal price. Chicken, schnitzel, or uh, meatloaf, things have changed a bit. But is there a limit how much you can drink? Nope, no, just as much as you want. Here, I'm, yeah, I'm going to demonstrate. <laughs> no. Okay? That's We're going to fill the whole soap. pitcher and drink as much and as we want. it's still here. It's still here. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. It's very cheap. See, Rodo, the one thing missing is seasoning. It's very, very plain. plain. Well, this is incredible. This is this is like 50 plus shekels. You can get refills as much as you want. You got unlimited soda. I actually don't remember it, the schnitzel to be so tasty. It's a pretty good schnitzel. <laughs> it's yeah, incredible. It's right? I tell you what, I could I could eat this every day. I like it. I love the salad and the corn and the potatoes. I'm I'll come here again. <laughs> <laughs> I would too. <laughs> awesome. Great. This kibbutz, Tirat Tzvi, is very unique. Founded in 1937, it is the first religious kibbutz in Israel. That's right, not only is it a communal social living, it is also religious. A quite rare combination. Out of 250-some kibbutzim in Israel, only 16 of them are religious, with Tirat Tzvi being the pioneer. The kibbutz movement, in its essence, was a very secular movement. It was trying to be Zionist, meaning claiming it's our, our land by the Bible, but separating the Bible from the religion. Uh -huh. Trying to argue it's only an historical document, and we are the people of that document, so we have the right to live here. This kibbutz is one of a few, just a bit more than 10 kibbutzim, which were trying also to maintain the religious lifestyle. Mm -hmm. This is fascinating, because next, Danny is taking us to an institution one can rarely find in a kibbutz, a synagogue, or in Hebrew, Beit Knesset, meaning the house of assembly. Now, I, as a child, Sergio, I had to come here every morning for morning prayer and before going to Shabbat. What happens if you don't come? Uh, they don't like it. Oh, you if made. the rumor spreads <laughs> around, uh, your teacher comes to you, your parents come to you, and you better show up. Okay. <laughs> uh, now, there's no one in, so we're not disturbing anyone. We can have a little peek inside. Wow. It has a preaching stand in the middle. Wow. And the orientation is towards Jerusalem. Okay. And behind the parochet, behind that curtain, is where the Torah scrolls are kept. Wow. Uh, so there are the scrolls behind the, the veil. The holiest item is a Torah scroll. It's written in the same style as it was 2,000 years ago. That was proven with the discovery of the right. Dead Sea Scrolls. And on Monday, Thursday, and Shabbat, you take out and you read a portion there in the middle. Wow. That's the, the, the peak of the, of the prayer. So the preacher, the preacher stands there and everybody sits around him? Or? Yes. Wow. I, I used to sit with my dad right here. Wow. For 12 years. Wow. And when oh, wait, it was I'm... my bar mitzvah, Sergio, I, re I led the, the Friday evening services standing here, and the whole crowd was following my leading the Friday evening prayers. Well, and the next morning, I read the Torah. Well, that's interesting. You're not facing them. You're facing... Everybody's you're, facing. Everyone's facing Jews. Even if you're doing the uh, Yes, I'm service. leading, uh -huh. and the public is replying to my call. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, in front of the entrance to the synagogue, there's a little archaeological display, which I couldn't oh. care less as a child, but now as a grown-up, as an archaeologist, I always love watching these items. It includes even two milestones. 
For us, one of the most fascinating parts about the synagogue is the incredible archaeological item that is hanging on the outside wall. Now, in 1937, when the kibbutz is established, they, they settled here because the land was purchased by the Zionist movement. They had no idea that in 1956, on a hill just facing the kibbutz, they will find an ancient building with a menorah in the mosaic floor. I think it's the actual one. Ken, I'm done, I think it's the actual one. It's the actual one. And, and that means that they didn't just settle in this land because it was purchased. They settled in this land because it was their ancestral land. And what proves it better than finding an ancient synagogue in the fields of the kibbutz? Okay? This is one of those moments when you see why the Jews have struggled to uh, cultivate this land, because it's really returning to biblical and ancestral land. Nothing gets better than this. This is the most incredible archaeological find we've seen lately. But this isn't the only gem in this kibbutz, as Danny has taken us just across the street to show us more ancient and monumental finds. Whoa! They would mark distance from place to place by having a mark every miles pasos, every 1,000 double steps. Yes. It's called a milestone. This is a milestone? Yes. A milestone? Rhoda and I heard about these for years, but we've never seen one in real life. I've never seen one! It's so amazing thinking like people did these and like carved them and worked on them in the ancient times. Milestones were originally stone pillars, made from granite, marble, or whatever local stone was available. They were widely used by the Romans to mark distances between cities. In the center of Rome, they erected the Golden Milestone that marked the center of the Roman Empire. And even though the Golden Milestone has since been lost, numerous other milestones had been found throughout the empire, including one that stood right here in Teratzvi, marking the sixth mile from Beit Shan, a city that is also known by the name of Skitopolis. Here it says that you're in the sixth mile from Skitopolis. <gasps> what is Skitopolis? Beit Shan. Beit Shan. Okay, so this is still telling you the information, but most of it is imperial propaganda. Presenting Marcus Aurelius, Antoninus, Pius, Augustus, all the descendants of Augustus, yeah. and all their victories, they remind you who's the boss. So wherever you're on the roads, Marcus Aurelius is the boss. I've always got goosebumps. I've never seen a milestone. I've read about them. I know where they were supposed to be. Is this the real one? It's the real one. It's the actual one. They, they, did, they, got, they went over the paint. But ah, it's the actual it one, visible. yes. Okay. okay, but forget that. In Tel Shalem in 1976, an American tourist who was the brother of the nurse in my dad's clinic found a bust, half a body in bronze of the Emperor Hadrian. <laughs> this is an amazing, amazing discovery. I remember as a child when it was on display right here. The real stuff was here. And moved to the Israel Museum and it's on prime display to this day at the Israel Museum. The Hadrian sculpture. The Hadrian it was, bust, it's called. It, yes. was, it was found here. Yes. Okay. Who knows what else is hiding in the vicinity of this kibbutz? Right. Totally. Somebody needs to excavate this. Somebody needs to come here and continue totally. the work. Totally. Today, we had a chance to see fascinating archaeology, a synagogue, and step into the kibbutz life. A life which might not be suitable for everyone, as it takes away some of your freedom and individuality, but it was done for the sake of the community. Some might even argue that this lifestyle and this very place was essential for the establishment of this country. And despite the hardships that the parents had to endure, this place offered something utopian for the children that grew up here. You need to understand, it was a very simple childhood. There was no wealth. We all wore the same basic blue kind of clothes, but there was a lot of joy. There was a lot of, uh, you know, good childhood memories. Here. <laughs> wow. And while this episode is coming to an end, we are not done here. Next time, Danny is taking us behind the borders of the kibbutz into the countryside in a search after a very unique place. Can't even see the water. This is the natural spring. Then. A place so hidden that most people don't know it even exists. Mm -hmm.